It's very interesting to see that the methods the Watchtower has used over its history to justify its false predictions are taken directly from Adventist groups from the 1800s. Here are a few parallels I found. Number one, reset the date by pushing it just a bit farther off. Find some plausible explanation as to why the calculation was just a bit wrong. After William Miller's date passed, March 1844, Samuel Snow started a new movement for a new date and called it the True Midnight Cry, October 1844. This caught on like wildfire, and many followed it, including Miller. Nelson Barber predicted 1873, but when that time was almost past, he shifted focus to 1874. The Watchtower also did this after its failed prediction for 1914. The publication soon began promoting 1915, as you can see in this quote on the screen. This also shows they clearly did not perceive at that time any type of invisible presence. It's also interesting to note that Harold Camping also tried this in 2011. Number two, claiming they were not dogmatic and blaming the rank and file for taking it too far and impugning their motives. Here's the Millerite version of that. Mr. Miller and those who entered the work with him used the words if and plausible probable. They never allowed themselves to claim that their conclusions on these points of chronology and prophetic periods were positively correct. There was another class of teachers, novices in the faith. Some of them became positive and dogmatical. This teaching produced believers who were just as positive. We see here how Miller's supporters are trying to distance themselves from their own predictions by putting the focus on this nebulous other group of teachers who went much farther with it and were, um, much farther than the original group who was supposedly not so dogmatical. Um, here's the Watchtower use of that type of spin. Uh, here referring to 1914, they accuse members of reading into the Watchtower statements that were never intended. Now, if you go back and read their quotes before 1914, they were very clear and very dogmatic. And this is unbelievable that they would accuse members of this because there's no need to read anything into them. They were just straight up predictions of cataclysmic events. Um, Here's another quote about 1914. But what about the Bible students associated with Russell? Had some been attracted by the thought of their own early salvation rather than love for God and a strong desire to do his will? And then in regards to 75, considerable expectation was aroused regarding the year 1975. There were statements made then and thereafter stressing that this was only a possibility. And then there's another um, quote about 75 from the Proclaimer's book. And this stuff just makes your head spin. If you got a disillusioned with the society after the 1975 debacle, you didn't love God and you're an apostate. Talk about blame shifting. Number three, it got good results in making more people spiritually alert and keeping on the watch and did no harm. It's better to be prepared, just in case, than to be caught off guard. In Wellcombe's book on the Second Advent Movement, it was said that Miller's message about 1844 electrified the masses. Well, so does a Beatles concert, so what? Throughout the book, the end times hype that didn't pan out was justified by reporting conversions, emotionally charged meetings, and increased interest in spiritual matters. Saints rejoiced, the wicked trembled, backsliders quaked, and the word of the Lord grew and was glorified. What if we are mistaken? We did our duty. Our publications have and now are producing the most salutary effect upon the church and the world. Can we ever regret that souls were converted, that the virgins were awakened and prepared to meet their Lord? If then we are mistaken about the time, what harm can result to the church or world? Um, here's the Watchtower's way of using that type of spin, saying it doesn't hurt anybody and does a lot of good, from 1976. However, say that you are one who counted heavily on a date and commendably set your attention more strictly on the urgency of the times and the need of people to hear, and say you now, temporarily, feel somewhat disappointed. 
Are you really the loser? Are you really hurt? We believe you can say that you have gained and profited by taking this conscientious course. Also, you have been enabled to get a really mature, more reasonable viewpoint. I was personally in attendance at the Keep on the Watch convention a few years ago when this justification was given in a talk that actually referred to failed predictions. The speaker was boasting that the Watchtower organization were the only ones keeping on the watch and castigated Christendom for being asleep. So he amazingly turned what would be a cause to doubt the Watchtower being God's channel into a reason why they're so much better. I couldn't believe it. I actually was looking around to my sides and everywhere I could see faces to see if there was any reaction to it, but there really wasn't. A contemporary critic of Miller spoke out on this bogus justification for false predictions. Some persons take the ground that although they do not themselves believe that the material earth will be dissolved in 1843, yet it will do no harm for people in general to believe it, because if the end of the world should take place at that time, people will be prepared, having believed it beforehand, and it should not take and if it should not take place in the specified time, no harm will ensue from them having believed it, as they ought to be prepared at all times. But is this sound reasoning? Are you satisfied with it yourselves? Let's try this kind of apology for deception. You tell your neighbor that within three years his house will be burned, and that maybe his wife and children, and maybe even himself, will be destroyed in the flames. You see that it distresses him, that it gives him many sleepless nights and anxious days. When you are asked, Why do you torment your poor, credulous neighbor in this cruel manner? You reply, Oh, it is best for him to be prepared. His house may be burned down. Who can say it won't be? And if he believes it, he will certainly be prepared. And then, if it is not burned down in that time, he suffers no injury, because he comes off so much better than he expected to. Would you be satisfied with such a miserable apology for deceiving and tormenting the credulous? Suppose you should go to a happy, affectionate, confiding family of children, and make them believe that within three years their parents would die, and they would be left orphans, and be thrown upon the stinted charities of this cold world for their subsistence. If you were the father, would you not demand an explanation of the man who should then trifle with the happiness of your family and sport with the fears of your children? Suppose he should say, Oh, it is best for your children to be prepared. You may die, and they may be left orphans within three years. If they believe that this event shall happen, they will prepare themselves and be always ready. And then, if the event should not happen, it will not injure them to have been prepared, and they will be very agreeably disappointed in the end. Would you be satisfied with this lame justification of the deception? No, you would not. As the guardian of the best interests of your children, you would say to the deceiver, whether he were himself deceived or whether he were intentionally deceiving others, Sir, you must not destroy the peace of my house by these tales of horror. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. But suppose it should be true that interested sectarian leaders should tell these tales of terror merely to raise an excitement of which they might avail themselves for their own sectarian advantage and to spread their own peculiar views of religion. What would you say to them? Would you say, It is best to believe. It is best to be prepared. No. You would say, Away with the deception. Away with the deceivers. Of one thing I am certain, and of this all of you must be equally certain. There can be no case in which error is better than truth. Truth is the agent of God for the conversion of men, and nothing can compare with it. Error is always bad, always injurious, always deceptive, but truth is lovely, consistent, beneficial, and always leads the confiding soul aright. Take heed, therefore, that no man deceive you. Um, this is getting a little long, so I think I'll make a part two with some more spin methods.